Pitch Radio Free 501C, the voice of Rogue Tulips Consulting. I'm your host, Cecilia Sepp. Don't forget to subscribe. You don't want to miss any exciting episodes. This week, I welcome my guest, Gwen Donahue, CAE of the Pet Advocacy Network. And our topic is successful rebranding in five steps. Welcome to episode 195. Hey everybody, it's Monday, May 8th, and there is a newly coronated king in England. Congratulations, King Charles III. And that's actually a great introduction to today's topic because a little known historical fact, uh, the House of Windsor is a successful rebrand of the British royal family who used to be known as Saxe Coburg Gotha. And in order to sound more British, which they were, They changed their name to Windsor after Queen Elizabeth II's favorite castle, but that did happen a little bit before she was born. Welcome to this week's podcast. We're talking about successful rebrand. It's Radio Free 501C, and thanks for joining us. To our guest around the world, I should say to our audience around the world, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, and thanks for joining us. Radio Free 501C is the voice of Rogue Tulips Consulting, so thank you for listening. I'm your host, Cecilia Sepp. I'm the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips Consulting, and I want to welcome you to episode 195 in our countdown to our 200th episode. This week, I'm so excited to welcome a first-time guest who I've known for quite a while now, Gwen Donahue, and she is here to talk with us about their successful rebrand. I'm going to let her tell you about herself and say hello. Welcome to the show, Gwen. Thank you so much for having me, Cecilia. It's, It's great to be here, although I must say I would like to be an international guest and have just been in London for the uh, coronation. So I I was there for Diana and Charles's wedding many years ago, but that's... (laughs) Wow, nothing happens when I go to London, so (laughs) that's probably a good thing. (laughs) But no, thank you so much for having me. Well, you're welcome, and thanks for accepting my invitation. So, Gwen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, I uh, have served nonprofits in communications, marketing, and PR roles for nearly 20 years, Um, organizations such as 4-H, the National Association of Home Builders, and currently at the Pet Advocacy Network, where I'm the Vice President of Communications and Membership. And I'm with those organizations and where I am currently, I've worked to elevate and amplify the brands in order to achieve the organizational goals. Well, and you have a really great story to share with us today about your rebrand. What was the Pet Advocacy Network? network known as before your rebrand? So beginning in 1971, when we were founded, we were the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm so just kind of back. making a face uh, for those. <laughs> who speak, I'm kind of making a face because I, I said to Gwen, as we were prepping for the show today, I said, you know, this sounds kind of industrial. So I'm glad you changed your, your name and your brand. So well, and, and the brand had significant recognition. It was, we were known by our acronym as PJAC uh, within the pet care community, but uh, it definitely didn't describe our scope that had evolved dramatically over the 50 years uh, and outside the pet care community. And our main audience there is lawmakers because we serve as the legislative and regulatory voice for the responsible pet care community. So while we're a 501c6, we basically are, are the lobbying arm for the responsible pet care community. And with law. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you explain a little bit what you mean by responsible pet care community? Yeah, like- our members um, are everything from you know manufacturers, distributors, uh, breeders, uh, pet people who transport pets. Uh, you know, we represent anyone with the, an interest in the pet sector, but our goal is to make sure that people have access to healthy, well-treated pets the pets of their choice um, in an effort to you know, advance the human animal bond. We just recognize the mental and physical benefits of the human animal bond and feel that everyone should have access to that. And I agree. I've had pets my entire life. So uh, mostly dogs. Once while growing up, well, we had a parakeet once. 
various lizards, turtles, <laughs> things like that. Fish, not a big fan of hamsters and gerbils. Um, if I would have had kids and they said, mommy, can I get a hamster? I say, wouldn't you rather have a nice puppy? <laughs> You know, Which most sure made of them, them happy. You know, it well, unfortunately, I didn't have kids of my own, but that that was my plan because I had hamsters and gerbils and they are nasty and they throw things at you when you're not looking. So <laughs> it was the whole thing. I'd wake up in the morning and there'd be newspaper in my shoes because the gerbils would throw the newspaper out of the cage at night while I wasn't looking. And I'd wake up and where'd all this come from? So and then they're always trying to escape. No matter how well you treat them, you know, dogs, they want to be with you. So kids get a nice puppy. <laughs> so no, and, and people in the hamster and gerbil industry, please save the angry postcards because I do know there are people who love hamsters and gerbils. So thank you. So when back to every pet type of pet serves a, a place, you know, not everybody can take care of a dog or a cat, but a hamster or gerbil is great for someone who has small space or, you know, doesn't like I said, fish gerbils, pet, birds, and they all serve a purpose. They do. And, you know, I have a friend, as, uh, my friend I've known the longest in my life. We met when we were two. She loves guinea pigs. She always had guinea pigs. She just thought they were wonderful and they made her happy and she would play with them and it, it, well into adulthood. <laughs> so, uh, oh, and yeah. then her daughter, I had a couple as a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, we were dog people, uh, mostly dogs growing up. So, uh, so I would be like, and why do you like guinea pigs? But they, that was her animal, you know, and I think we all have our spirit animal, right. And her daughter who's grown now has a dog and a ferret. So, yeah. so they have a great time together. Oh, I'm not sure if the dog and the ferret have a good time together, but my friend's daughter loves her ferret and loves her dog and has a great time with both of them. So, but getting back to the successful rebrand, uh, we've we've established the importance of the animal-human relationship, and that's why the Pet Advocacy Network is important and why it exists. Was there a major motivator for you to do this rebrand? So I think from when we were we were founded by a. a just one person back in 1971. So 50 years is a really long time to be advocating on behalf of the pet care community. And we've really evolved over that time. Um, so knowing that we had the 50th anniversary coming up, we thought, well, that's the perfect time if, if we're going to pivot or you know take on a new persona or realign what we, you know, our brand, that's the perfect time to do it. So that really was the, the motivator. And you mentioned uh, that you had five P's of successful rebranding, and I I think these are great. Can you share those with the audience? Sure. I, I can talk about the five P's, but then probably need to describe what each of them means. Uh, the, I, they are plenty, partner, plethora, participation, and promote. And they all align with five tips for a successful rebrand. Well, let's start with plenty. Uh, what plenty of what? Plenty of time. Yeah. We gave, we, it took us about 15 months to do this. Now we had intended to do it. Our, so our actual 50th anniversary came on December 7th, 2021. And we had planned for that to launch, but as everybody knows, 2020 kind of threw a wrench in everybody's plans. Yes. So we ended up, we put out our RFP in December, December of 2020, started work in March of 2021. It took us about five months to decide on the rebrand because we actually, we left it open that we may stick with the name. We may try and fit different words to the acronym because the acronym was so well known. So we really were very open-minded about that process. Uh, but when we arrived at the new name, then another seven months to develop a whole new website, we didn't try and put a Band-Aid on <laughs> the one we had. We completely did a whole new website as well as a whole suite of collateral and support materials so that when we did launch, everybody could talk about it. Everybody knew how to use the logo, tell the story, everything. It's so really, yeah, it was 15 months from start 15 to finish. Months. 15 months. Wow. And that's still, you know, you know, to me, 15 months is really not that much time to do a rebrand. Uh, so you must've been very focused. 
we were. We uh, And actually, this is a great segue into tip number two, find the perfect partner to work with. Knowing you know, we're a small organization, we have nine on staff and only two of us in marketing communications, we weren't going to do this on our own. So we, when we put out the RFP, we were looking for a partner both to do the rebrand as well as a website partner. And we were very precise about that. We had a very detailed RFP. We, I think we narrowed it down to three or four finalists. And it's really a matter of both the experience those organizations have or those companies have, as well as the chemistry. You, you know, you're going to be embedded with these people for a while and, and you know, really discussing all aspects of your brand. Um, and so we ended up working with uh, Inspire PR Group, which is a, a shop out of Ohio. We know them because they had experience in the pet sector. So we had you know, worked with them before and, and really knew that they knew our, our industry. Uh, and they came on board with a group called Escape Hatch that did the website for us. So it was nice that they already had an existing partnership. They worked well together. We knew we worked well with Inspire. So it was a very synergistic choice. I, sorry, I just love the name Escape Hatch for a company. <laughs> That's great. So Escape Hatch did the website. That's wonderful. Yeah. So you had a great team put together of both, uh, you know, in-house staff and then, you know, outsourcing uh, to some great contractors. So then plethora for So that is for the plethora of research that you need to do to affect a, a successful rebrand. Uh, and we started big. We surveyed the entire membership as well as key industry players, kind of on their perception of our work, our effectiveness, um, what value we provide to their business. From some of the results from that, we did a questionnaire and then did more in-depth, almost not even focus groups, but interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, with our board Again, key industry stakeholders really you know, drove deep into what challenges and opportunities, as well as what future they saw for our organization. And from there, then we started looking at, and, and actually what that found is that while the name had some brand equity in the pet care community, it didn't with our primary audience of lawmakers. And everybody felt it was kind of time for a change, that the old name didn't really encompass the scope of what we do. So then we started embarking on looking for a new name. And even there, there's a lot of research. We you know, drove down, we, and, and like I said, Inspire was great. They came up with a whole range of everything from ridiculous names that had nothing to do with pets to <laughs> names that fit the acronym, if we wanted to you know, keep that, to other names. Uh, we narrowed it down to two and then, then had to do research on the URLs and trademarks and you know, potential confusion or misuse with other organizations. So th that was a very in-depth process. That's true, you know, and and yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I can relate to a ridiculous company name myself and making sure. <laughs> no, well, this, it, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it has a purpose. I mean, that that is, is definitely, and, and that was one of the reasons with some of the names they threw out is people would have to ask, what is it that you do? Yeah. Well, but I think with, with I, Pet Advocacy Network, it just, it was ideal. And then when we found out the URL Pet Advocacy was available, we thought that's great because that in a nutshell is what we do. Well, and before we move on to the, the fourth P, when you were looking at buying your website URLs, did you buy every single URL that had your name in it or were you selective about which ones you bought? As, as you know, with all the different, you know, dot co, dot TV, dot, they, we didn't buy every single one of those, but we did kind of the dot org, dot net, dot com, um, as well as both Pet Advocacy and Pet Advocacy Network, knowing that people, you know, could likely type in both. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that, I, you know, I was just curious because uh, when I launched my company back in 2018, I did the same thing. I researched website URLs and figured out what was available. And I, and I bought all the ones I wanted. And I actually bought a couple extra that I know I would probably never use simply, you know, keep market awareness uh, and, and not cause any confusion. 
And then once in a while, the company I use for managing my URLs will, will send me an email and say, hey, this one just became available. No, I'll buy it. <laughs> you know, it's like 15 bucks. So it's like, could be my retirement plan someday. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right? like, you never know what's going to be invented that, that will be <laughs> ideal for that URL and you'll get a big right. offer. <laughs> you know, right. Exactly. You know, so invest in URLs, you never know. Um, so then the fourth one is participation. Yes. And that relates to stakeholders. Make sure you get stakeholder participation. You want to build consensus throughout the process. Uh, both we did as part of the, the survey research, part of the, the audience interviews. Uh, I also made sure to get board members to volunteer to serve on our task force so that they were part of it throughout. And I had them report in, on our progress at the board meetings. Um, I will say I had an experience at a, at a previous job where there wasn't enough consensus. And when a rebrand was revealed, it uh, you could hear crickets in the room. It was, I, I think the, the people who are involved and especially boards need to feel like they're part of the process all the way along. And, and I think that was key to our success is, is that I had these two very involved board members that, that they did all the reporting. They really, you know, took ownership of it and it wasn't seen as a staff driven exercise. Oh, that's great. And that's really a great staff board partnership example, I think. Yeah, yeah, both the the board members were and they also they they came from pet care companies that had and they had a lot of marketing experience. So they really had some different insights to add to the process from staff who just had a, you know, nonprofit type of perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's really uh, an excellent example, again, of participation, bringing in your stakeholders, and then to the fifth P, which is promote. Yes, and my tip there is to promote your brand, your, your relaunch with a hook or a story. And, and this is where we just had a perfect storm come together. I mean, we had our 50th anniversary coming up. Uh, we use that, so on, December 7th, 2021, our actual 50th anniversary, we issued a press release talking about the 50th anniversary, saying that we were launching a year-long celebration, and we were starting it with a social media campaign revealing 50 memorable moments in PJAC history, and you don't want to miss the 50th memorable moment, which we were going to reveal at the first big pet trade show of the year. And knowing that the 50th memorable moment was going to be the name change. So for the next three months, we had a social media drip campaign of 50 memorable, well, 49 memorable moments throughout <laughs> our history. So, um, we also used social media to do a 10-day countdown uh, where we just, you know, had cute animal pictures and, and a play on words like, you know, we're kitten ready to reveal our 50th memorable moment. And we did those. Um, so, I mean, that was the 50th anniversary was the perfect hook. We had a party at the trade show where everybody gathered thinking that they were just going to toast our, you know, 50th anniversary and we revealed the new name and logo. So I have a question. I mean, those five P's are great uh, and it's a great list. I want to repeat that again for the audience. So Gwen Donahue's five P's of successful rebranding, plenty of time, perfect partner, plethora of research participation of stakeholders, and promote with a hook or a story. And uh, as you said, you used your 50th anniversary. So I'm curious, since uh, we were talking about naming earlier, and you said they came up, your partner Inspire PR came up with a lot of different options. So how did you finally select the name that you chose? I think because it just is such an accurate description of what we do. I mean, we serve as a connector between the responsible pet care community and government entities at the local, state, federal, and international level advocating for pet ownership and pet well-being. So advocacy is what we do. Network it indicates that connection. And pets is, in our logos, you can see, is, is the most dominant word because that is one of our core values is pets come first. And that's, uh, I, and I love that. That's great. And it sounds like the name was chosen with input from as many people as possible too. It wasn't like you just sat down and said, I like this one for oh, all no. the reasons you just said, <laughs> <laughs> and just like, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, and, uh, no, and the logo and the logo mark had a great story too. I don't um, know if you 
we're able to show the video and then I can kind of describe it or. Sure. I was just going to say, let's go to the video. Go ahead. Oh, we have video. We don't usually do this. So we apologize in advance for any issues that we may see or not see. Now, and this is something that we had created to tell the story in a visual way. And let's see if we can get this to play. Here we go. Yes, and, and your screen is black for a reason because I'm trying to turn this on. There we go. And up oh, there's the play button. So that's actually one thing I neglected to mention when we were deciding to start on this process is our old logo had a figure that resembled an owl. Well, we don't consider owls pets. So <laughs> that was that was probably the dominant thing that was wrong with our, our logo. But yeah, yeah I noticed know. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so, <laughs> well, and we have so many constituencies within the pet care community that represent different kinds of pets. It was it was really hard because you can't do a paw or you know a feather. We we had to find it, and this is where the designer at Inspire PR Group just really knocked it out of the park. Is is the logo mark Sim symbolizes pets, but there isn't any one. Um, as you saw on the drawing, the the two. The, the shape there signifies the eyes, ears, nose, and whisker of could be a, a cat, a dog, a gerbil, you know, any animal with fur. Each of the individual elements could be a bird or one of those colorful betta fish with their flowing fins um, or a lizard. So it, it's one thing we constantly say now with the logo, Mark, once you see the two eyes and the nose, you can't unsee it. That's right. So, I agree with that. Yeah, because as, as I was prepping for our episode, and I was watching the video and, and reading the press release on your website that I, yeah, I can't not see the face now. <laughs> well, and even the colors were purpose, purposely chosen. The, they signify the elements that the animals that become pets come from. So the light blue is the sky, the dark blue is the sea, and the green is land. Oh, so I never picked up on that. <laughs> no, that's it was wonderful. in a press release. <laughs> So, oh, I guess I didn't read the whole press release then. Okay, oh, that's on me. Okay, audience, yes, that's on me, uh, not reading the whole thing. But uh, but seriously, I like the logo as well because it also makes me think of a peacock and peacocks aren't really pets, but you know, sometimes they will live on someone's estate. And yes. if, if you go to the St. Louis Zoo, they try to steal your popcorn, but that's another <laughs> story. <laughs> so uh I just think this is a wonderful example of a very successful rebrand that really gets across the spirit of your organization. And we've had a lot of fun talking about it too, but what, was there anything else that you learned going through this rebrand process? I think just the amazing, huge number of moving parts that you have to, to manage in a rebrand. Um, even the launch, you know, I, I said that we threw a party, but we had to have our whole collateral suite ready. We had to have banners. We had a step and repeat. We had to work with the trade media and the trade show that we were launching at in advance under embargo to get articles in. So the show dailies that the next, you know, the, our party was the night before the trade show opened, but the next day, the show daily that people picked up on their way onto the trade show floor had an article about the rebrand. And the signage on the doors, because the group that put on the trade show, we're one of their, they, they fund us. So they had, we're proud supporters of. And so Pet Advocacy Network was on the signs. We had to work with some of our partners who also have our logo on their signs and, and get it out to them ahead of time. Um, not to mention, we had to set an email to go out to all our members. It's specifically timed. The website went live. The social media handles all had to change all like on a specific time frame. So it was uh, definitely a lot of juggling moving parts, but it just came off flawlessly. Oh, it sounds like it. Well, congratulations on that. That That is a huge project. And when you start talking about all the different things you have to do as follow-up, 
when you do a rebrand. Uh, has anybody, it, not, I don't want this to be a gotcha question. It's not meant to be, but has anybody pushed back and said, oh, I like the old name better? You know, no. The feedback we got was just great. Um, I captured some of them for testimonials to use in award submissions. So, it, and I have to say, we put in for a number of awards from national PR news, nonprofit awards. We won Best Rebrand. Uh, PR Daily, we won Best Rebrand. The uh, Association Trends Trendy Awards, we were uh, a bronze medal there. So really, you know, across the board, it's been universally recognized as, as just an outstanding rebrand. That is wonderful to hear. Congratulations and well-deserved. Thank you. And, and I definitely also want to say I had two women working for me that won, um, you know, concurrent or consecutively that just were instrumental in this because they, they were workhorses. They got made sure that as I was crossing T's and dotting I's that I wasn't dotting T's and crossing I's. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, Allie Brimmer and Lynn Taylor, are, Allie went on to uh, go on to grad school, but Lynn is still with us as our marketing communications manager and, and her help as well as is my colleagues that, you know, were there to, to support all this was just instrumental. That's, well, and you, thank you for sharing the praise and the accomplishment with other people, because none of us does anything on our own. No, absolutely. Um, and it, 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 hopefully it was a great experience for both of them because they're, they're very early in their careers. So this that's one thing you learn working for a small organization is you get to wear 16 different hats. <laughs> so Oh my gosh. That is the truth. Uh, I had Jen Swanson on a couple weeks ago and we were talking about being the solo staff department. She's a solo yes, staff yes. marketing department. I was a solo staff uh, component relations director for a number of years. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of hats for everybody. Even if you're on a team, people would do more than one thing. So yeah. Yeah. And I have to say our CEO was just great in letting me go with it. You know, he he definitely didn't need, I brought him in on, on the big decisions and the big things that needed to happen. And he just had full confidence in, in my ability to pull it off. So Mike Bober, thank you very much for that. Hey, props to props to Mike. Well done. <laughs> so, and that that's a great example. It's, it's May 8th. We're in basically week two of the CAE exam period, uh, which Gwen and I remember taking our CAE exam. We're both CAE. So that's an excellent example of leadership. If you're listening to this, getting ready for the exam, or you've just taken the exam, or you're thinking about taking the exam, it's really about leadership. And it's about letting your team do what they do best and getting out of their way. So yeah, um, I'm actually coming up on my first renewal. Oh, so. congratulations. Wow. It's been three years already. It has. It has. I had, it was, I, I was studying for it when we were all work from home in the early stages of the pandemic. So it was a, a great opportunity to really dig into, you know, what I needed to do and passed on the first try, but yeah, we're already coming up on renewal. Wow. It just seems like, just like, recently that I was talking with you right before you took the exam. I remember we had a long conversation, reviewed some things and mindset tips and wow, three years already. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's well done. So that's, that's definitely a place where you want to bring in your, uh, your partnerships and participation. It's uh, that the study groups were key for that and, and also having a study partner. Definitely. I'm glad you said that. So for those of you out there who are considering becoming a CAE candidate, what Gwen said, you need at least a study buddy, if not a study group. So find your people and help each other pass. Yes. So, well, Gwen, before we wrap up this episode, and, and first of all, I want to thank you again for being just such a fun guest. I've had a great time well, talking to you. And wonderful outline of how to do a successful rebrand. Uh, but before we ask you for your final thought, what you'd like the audience to take away, do you have a tip for CAE candidates who are currently taking the exam? I would say my, the biggest help for me was taking the practice exams and then going through them with my study partner 
we'd each take the practical exam and then discuss the answers. Yeah, and that was so helpful. Um, I think the books, there's so much information in them and you tend to just kind of get overwhelmed. Um, so really, really, really take the time to do as many practice exams as you can get your hands on. That's a great tip. And that helps you put the data into context when you talk it through with somebody. So I love that tip. So, well, we do have to go rogue for now because we don't want Gwen to give away all of her secrets. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Gwen, I like to ask my guests, what is the one thought you would like the audience to take away today? And if they wanted to ask you some more questions, maybe they're going to do a rebrand. How can they get in touch? Yeah. So um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think maybe it's, it's just the LinkedIn backslash and the Gwen Donahue. Um, or my email address at Pet Advocacy Network is Gwen, G-W-Y-N, at petadvocacy.org. And I would just say, you know, that the final P, I know I gave you five Ps, but the, the overarching umbrella P is preparation. Um, you just got to put everything you can into thinking about every single thing that, that might happen. And, you know, some of these ideas, the, the 50 memorable moments, I, I distinctly remember waking up in the middle of the night and reaching over to my phone and taking, excuse me, a voice memo because I was like, oh, I can't forget this. Um, just write everything you think about down and, and you know, preparation. And I love that tip. That's a great tip of the 50 memorable moments, you know, building up to something like that. That's, that's a great thought to take away. So, well, everybody, we have to go rogue for now. I want to thank my guest, Gwen Donahue from the Pet Advocacy Network for joining us and sharing her experience with a successful rebrand. Uh, it's a great story and a great example. And one of the reasons I love doing this podcast, because I get to uh, share all this great information with broader audience. So if you would like to learn more about Rogue Tulips Consulting and how we got our crazy name, uh, you can check us out online at roguetulips.com. We provide a variety of services to nonprofit organizations of all kinds, and we're always happy to talk with you about what your needs might be. If you are a current CAE looking for CAE credits or that ethics renewal credit, or you're a CAE candidate looking for a study group or a course about CAE topics, or you're just a curious sort like myself, check out our education program, the 501C League, that has its own website, the 501cleague.net. You can learn more information about our upcoming fall schedule. And we have a practice exam if you want to check that out too. So uh, thanks for joining us this week, everybody. Please remember to subscribe so you don't miss any more of these great uh, conversations I get to have with people all across our profession. And uh, on behalf of Gwen and myself, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time.